Hello and welcome to the FDT TV podcast. My name is Ian and as always I am joined by Mike. Uh, this week we are sort of happy but sad. Uh, there, there are a couple of deaths within the footballing world uh, in David Gold and Gianluca Vialli, uh, which has sort of had an impact in some senses. Gareth Bowers now retired and gone on to play golf. Uh, and João Felix may be the most expensive loan transfer ever. So a real mixed bag of what's going on in the world of football at the moment. Uh, but before we get into it, how are you doing, Mike? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, mate. It's... Um crazy weekend i'd love to say it's because of drinking but it definitely wasn't um but some good results and i've got to be honest i little feel a little bit cheated by the um the arsenal newcastle game but i'm sure we'll come on to that mm. in a bit anyway but um yeah it's, it's all right bad, you, mate. how are you you got man city in the cup it's fine don't worry about it yeah great <laughs> Yeah, no, it's all good. It's a little bit bittersweet on my end at the minute with uh, David Moyes mm. still being at West Ham. Good results, but not what we wanted, uh, as backwards as that sounds. Uh, but before we really get into things, what you need to go and do is go over to the YouTube channel, uh, FDT-TV, look for the big gold cup, and press that subscribe button. That really help us out. Um, so, I think we should start off with the solemnness and then get into some silliness. Um David Gold, uh, obviously West Ham fan, grew up on Green Street, just just literally mere metres away from Upton Park. Uh, you could see his front door from Upton Park, the director's box, which was quite strange. Um, played for West Ham as a teen as a teenager between thirteen and sixteen, uh, and then appeared in the youth team a few years later, and went full circle. Eventually, he ended up owning the club that he grew up down the road to, um, and. As much as he got a bit of hate and a bit of stick, actually, out of the p- people who did own it, I think he was the good egg. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, so he's he's passed on. I, I believe he was 87, um, so a decent age. Um, but, yeah, it was uh, one of those, it was a bit of a shock that all of a sudden that news came and he's, he's gone. Um, the other one, Gianluca Vialli. Chelsea and Juventus striker, uh, fairly successful at Chelsea as a striker, if I'm honest. I think it was almost a goal, uh, a goal every other game. Um, something like twenty six in fifty two or something like that. So, not a bad record. He went on to manage them later on, uh, as well as Watford. Um, it was actually the assistant manager for Italy um, up until a couple of days before his death. So, just be, uh, just he helped him to that Euro title last year um so yeah but love football and only stepped down a couple of days before he passed away so uh yeah mm. two two uh two impacts two different clubs or lots of different clubs i should say um and yeah hope folks go out to their families so that's that's the solemn bit of the podcast um but happy news gareth bow has retired <laughs> a, a man who's spent the last seven years of his career or so at Real Madrid playing golf um, is now 500 to 1 to win the Masters. <laughs> so, I mean, the strangest things have happened. He, his transition to golf will probably be a bit more successful than Michael Jordan's to baseball. Um, <laughs> but What a link. Yeah, I mean, what do, you, what do you say? Here's the thing with golf. I know we're a primarily football podcast, but the golfing world is going through some big changes at the minute with, with their this live golf that has popped up and paying people loads of money. It wouldn't surprise me if he's a big name that gets on that tour. Uh, it's by, by the sounds of things from people who are in the footballing world and what they say, his golf is really, really good. So, yeah, watch this space, I think. Um don't know if he'll, he'll... Do you know what handicap he plays off? Uh, no idea, mate. No I would idea. assume it's a scratch. Uh, yeah, I've got got no idea. I'll, I'll have a look in a minute. Um, but yeah, so he, he's retired. Um, if if someone says Gareth Bale to you, what's the, what's the memory that you have of him? Is it the same as mine? Is there something that particularly <coughs> springs to mind? I... Uh, to be honest, I don't... When he left Spurs, I kind of lost interest in him because it was such a ridiculous move being on ridiculous wages. Now, <clears throat> I did see something that cropped up on social media and it was, is Gareth Bale Britain's greatest player? 
um, or it was something <laughs> like that. Um, <clears throat> and I thought it was a ridiculous question to ask, if I'm being completely honest. Now, looking at the honours which he's won, apparently he's won five Champions Leagues, yeah. you would have to say he is good. But he's no Gary on paper Neville. Because it... Sorry? But he's no Gary Neville. No. <laughs> um, but just on paper, when you see his uh, honours and stuff like that, yep. you would have to say he is he is good. Yes. But from from what I can gather, or from what I remember, the la- the latter part of his career, he was very injury stricken. Yep. Um, I don't think he's played properly for Real Madrid for I don't even know how long. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't really do much of the Euros, uh, the Euros, the World Cup. Yep. Um, yeah, I just, I, I don't really know if I can, if I can class him as Britain's greatest footballer. Um, I think if you looked at him in his prime, you would put him up there as as one of the better players that Britain has produced. Uh, and so, mm-hmm. as you say, his honours list is is very good. But as a as a career in total, I think it sort of fell to the wayside a little bit after the first mm. couple of years at Real Madrid. Um, I mean, for me, it's one of those things you could counteract that with when he first, uh, when he was at left back at Tottenham, every time he played, they lost and they went for about 12 games or something where if he played, they lost. So he had a a real dodgy start to his playing career that I'm sure almost, um, got him, got him sacked off from Tottenham. Um, but then he started to play a little bit more forward, didn't he? And I think hmm. the the game for me that really cemented him as this this guy's there's something about him was when he ripped into Milan apart, did those gut busting runs up the line, come off the pitch, went round the player, and still managed to to score the goal. Um, hmm. And I think that for for most people is is what they remember if you say Gareth Bale um, that one particular game. Um, he obviously has done other things. As he said, Champions League final, he, he went for a stage. I think he's, he, he set up one and scored one in consecutive Champions League finals. Um, but yeah, retired 33, obviously made his money and he's not really worried about playing no more. So he's going to go and do what he enjoys. Hmm. Um, I mean, he, he did have a second stint, didn't he, at Tottenham? I almost forgot about that. It's just popped back into my mind. Pretty forgettable, if I'm totally honest. I think it was one of those, mm. like Ronaldo going back to Manchester United, probably should have left it. Um, yeah. But uh, it was once the most expensive transfer in the world. Broke Ronaldo's record going to Real Madrid. Um, and one that's not quite the most expensive transfer in the world, but maybe the most expensive loan, is on the other side of the screen. Jao Felix, attacking midfielder, centre-forward, winger. I don't really know where you'd put him. He can play all those positions. <laughs> um, still a younger player in terms of, of, of footballers, um, but hasn't really lived up to the promise he showed at Benfica when he moved to Atletico Madrid. Um, so he's being linked. He, I think Arsenal were linked with him at one point. Manchester United were, Chelsea were, and now it looks like he's going to go to Chelsea on loan. Um, and... Uh, Give us the figures, Mike, because you, you, you seem to know a bit more about the figures than I do. <coughs> so it's um, 11, I, I believe it's 11 million pounds. It's either 11 million pounds or 11 million euros. And they, uh, Chelsea, have to pay his salary for the remainder of the season. Um, personally, I when I first heard about this, I was like, oh, OK, yeah, that's a um, nice, nice option to have. Um, <coughs> but... If I'm being completely honest, not really what we need. Um, when you look at the the players we've got in his uh, his position, um, obviously depending on where you are going to play him, but you've got um, Martin Erdegaard, you've got Emil Smith Rose just back from injury, Martinelli, Saka, um, Eddie Nketiah is a as a player that I've got to say I was a little bit worried about or a little bit concerned about. Um, obviously, with the uh, injury to Gabriel Jesus, would he be able to step up? Um, so it'd be n- a nice to have if he was going to play as a, excuse me, backup striker. Um, but I don't know. Um, or if if I if I'd have seen this payout that sort of money, 
I think I would have been angry with that, especially with the fact that he is only for six months with no option to buy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we need someone that wants to uh, wants to come in, hit the ground running, and if they don't, that's an expensive mistake to make. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, it, it's <laughs> it seems to be whoever we're linked with, Chelsea's um, Chelsea's owner has gone in. Oh yeah, we'll we'll throw a hat on that one as well. So he obviously trusts the uh, the the Mikel Arteta process. <laughs> uh, obviously, I don't know if it's a name that we were seriously considering. Obviously, it may may have been an inquiry, and when they've said to us the figures, we've just gone, Do you know what, fuck that. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be a ridiculous bit of business. But obviously, we've seen a Barry Yang flop at Chelsea, um, for uh, probably on ridiculous wages as well. Mm-hmm. Are we going to see another flop? Yeah, uh, in fairness, because six months is not a lot of time to adjust to the Premier League. No, it's not. It's one of those players though that I feel has a lot of potential, at, but doesn't suit the way that Diego Simeone plays at Atletico Madrid. Very defensive setup. Where at Benfica, when you look at some of the players that have come out there recently, like Darwin Nunes, f- thrive on being heavy possession and 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 in a better attacking team. Are Chelsea that in a minute? No. But they are still missing a number of key players. So I think the Chelsea set up the way Graham Potter plays may uh, benefit his play style slightly more. So I think for Atletico Madrid, they're getting a decent a decent deal for it f- to get rid of him for six months uh, from their end. And realistically, I think it's for them after that, it's only got upside because he could go for a lesser fee. If he hits the ground running and he's phenomenal... People are going to want to buy him again, at which point he becomes a really expensive asset. So I, I think then mm-hmm. there's very little downside. It, it seems like his his Athletic Madrid playing career is over. Um, can he make it in the Premier League? Let's let's wait and see. Um, so in terms of transfers, though, because because it is it is it is transfer around about time. In the series, the Moroccan striker. Uh, of Seville, I believe, has been linked with West Ham again. Apparently, we're trying to get a deal over the line. The interesting thing is, Moyes is saying the board have told me there's no signings yet. The board are coming out, uh, and ev- the other noises are coming out from the club saying, "No, we- we've got some targets. We're trying to get some decent players in." So, as I said last week, doesn't quite add up to what's what. I know you can never really tell until till you get that that picture on the club website. Uh, the player holding up the shirt, but he seems to be at total different ends to the board as he was last year where they were desperately trying to sign players and he was saying no to all of them. So he not not a good way to be playing with the fans at the minute, Mr Moyes. Um, <laughs> Arsenal, on the other hand, uh, still being linked with, and it sounds like there is a potential... Uh, being a lot closer for the other guy, Murik, is it Mujic? I Mujic. don't know how you pronounce his name. Is it the Ukrainian left winger uh, yes. from Shakhtar? Is it? Yes. Um, so, I mean, have you have you seen anything else that confirms that or or, or brings it a little bit more to fruition? No. The um, up, depending on which source that you look at, I mean, my sources are Twitter. Um, I know, obviously, there's. There's been or there has been some confirmed interest. Obviously, Sky Sports are, are ones that have spoken about the deal because Chelsea were also coming in, um, apparently looking to match Shakhtar's valuation, right? Uh, but also, um, Chelsea wanted to have reassurances from the player that he is interested in coming to Chelsea before obviously they make the bid. Now, from what I have seen, um, he wants to come to Arsenal, wants to work with Mikel Arteta, uh, has been seen watching uh, some of the Arsenal games, not being afraid to hide it on his uh, Instagram posts. Uh, so I think it's, it is one, and I have seen a couple of um, notifications today to say that the deal was edging closer. Um, again, obviously, we'll take that with a pinch of salt, as you've just mentioned, and until it's on... Till it's confirmed by Sky Sports and on the club's website, um, you just got to take it with a pinch of salt. Another player that we have been linked with, yep. um, I believe, is um, one Declan Rice. Yes, I've um, seen that for around about eighty odd million pounds. And You're not having me shirt. Can't... 
Sorry. He's not having me shirt. He's not happening. I wouldn't want it in that color, mate. Um, <laughs> no, I um I I don't know again about how um how true that that may be. Uh, I believe he might be out of contract soon. Is that correct? Uh, I think I think he's got a deal that runs to the end of twenty twenty four, possibly twenty five. But I can't. I really can't remember oh, okay. off the top of my head. I I know it's. I don't. I know he's not out of contract in the summer. So I don't know if it's the summer after or if he's got two years after that. Um, okay. But yeah. I, so again, I, I prob- that probably too. all just speculation, and it, it probably won't happen. Um, I, I don't know. But I, again, I would. I wouldn't know who we would replace. I think that's that's a, a look at replacing an aging Jacker or possibly a, a Thomas Party as his injury proneness at the minute. Um, possibly. And and I know it's biased, but I do think he's one of the best defensive midfielders in the world. He has been playing a little bit more forward for us, which he he's able to do, and he can hit a ball. But I think his strength lies as a defensive midfielder that role that Fernandinho played for so many years for Manchester City, the Sergio Biscuits of this world. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and if I'm honest, the way we're playing in a minute, uh, and I've said it before, he, he gives his all for the club every time he's on the pitch, but he said he wants to win things, and I don't blame him. He doesn't want to end up as a sort of a Harry Kane, Harry one Kane. of the best players to never have done anything. Do you know what I mean? It's not the legacy yep. you want to leave. Um and I wouldn't I wouldn't blame him for leaving. We have tried to make moves in a transfer market, but it's not it's not happened. Um we have tried to, to forge forward, but it's not happened. Not saying it could never happen. Is it likely to happen in the next two or three years? Probably not. Um, although we may fall forward a little bit more. Had we won the Europa League last year, he would have signed a long-term contract. I'm a firm believer in that. That didn't happen. Um, but yeah, £80 million I think is probably what he's going to go for. There may be a player chucked in there somewhere along the line, whether it's going to... The the other one I've, I've seen him linked with is Man City with a cash and swap deal with Calvin Phillips. So it wouldn't surprise me if if we got uh, one of your younger players or something like that or a left back perhaps um to, that comes along with a bit with a bit of cash um mm. but yeah I wouldn't hold it against him if he did want to move to what looks like title champions at the minute so yeah we'll see <laughs> still a long way to go there is always long... you talking about Manchester City well well one either one of you it's going to be one <laughs> of you isn't it um so the the other weird one which I have seen uh which is again a Besiktas player at the minute Mar- I think his name's Martin Weghorst. The yes, real big to lump. Manchester United. Yes, who played for Burnley. He's a Burnley player, but he's on loan. There isn't a recall mm-hmm. option. Uh, Burnley are trying to get Besiktas to rip up the contract. They don't want to, uh, but Manchester United want him on loan. Um, so, I mean, his presses in the Premier League for that six months he played for Burnley were actually really good. He's a big lump. He does know where the goal is throughout his career, uh, but only a short-term option. And I think Besiktas want a little bit of money out of it to be able to say, well, hang on, you're going to benefit out of this financially. We want some of that cheese. Um, But that is only a short-term deal because, as you've seen on the thumbnail, which is why you clicked on this video, Harry Kane allegedly is Manchester United's number one summer transfer target. Now, he only has a year left on his contract. Uh, I know he was linked with Bayern Munich, but I don't think he's going to want to leave the Premier League. I think he wants Alan Shearer's goal record. And if you look at how Manchester United have been playing recently under um, Eric Ten Hag, I don't think it would be a bad fit necessarily to have him in there. Because uh, yep. he, he knows where the goal is, but they're ha- obviously... Uh, lacking a real out and out striker so he can sit in the box and, and just play that role he can sit a little bit deeper and let the wingers and the midfielders run past him he's done both of them at Tottenham so that n- probably wouldn't be a bad fit um, the only thing I would say is when you look at Manchester United they're quick and that's the only 
bit of, of Harry Kane's game that I think lets him down is that he's not quick. But if he's playing that Bobby Firmino sort of number nine role, passing it, playing a little bit deeper, then I think it's a perfect fit. Um, and with only a year left to go, Daniel Levy being a businessman, I think we'll, we'll cash in. It won't be a cheap deal, um, but I can't no. see him letting him go on a free. I just, no. I, it's, it's, it, it would not make sense to, um, even if you get 50 million out of it. Do you know what I mean? Because it's the last year of a contract. If we don't sign him now, that's fine. We'll sign him for free in six months. Not a problem. Um, mm. But yeah, that, that potentially will be the big deal of the summer, I think. Other than Declan Rice. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I do agree. I did see... Um... I did see that one, and it does make sense because um, it. Well, effectively, he's got one more big move, isn't he? Because yes. he's still the wrong side. Oh, he's the, still the right side of thirty currently. But I think at the time, at the start of next season, he'll be I in think, his thirties. Yeah, I think he'll be thirty-one. Mm. So, so um, <clears throat> yeah, one more big move, three-year deal. Be yeah. stupid not to cash him. Yeah. And so with that, I think he could be the centre of a potential bidding war because I can't see Haaland moving. I can't see Mbappe moving. Um, and uh, Real Madrid, Benzema is out of contract. Uh, Bayern Munich, they're missing Lewandowski. Manchester United won a striker. Actually, the best of the rest uh, that is the right sort of age is Harry Kane. Um, the other one which in terms of strikers which I think is an interesting move uh, and I'm surprised more people are not jumping on it Yusuf Makoko from Borussia Dortmund so he was the next star striker at Borussia Dortmund before they signed Erling Haaland he's still only 17 I think 18 maybe uh, pounced onto the scene as a 15 year old uh, absolutely bossing under 19 games Um and he's been linked with Newcastle, which I think is a very interesting move. Uh, so they're obviously probably going to pay over the odds for the potential. Will it work out? I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, it's whether, again, that, that thing of do, does he surround himself with the right people to keep the right mentality? Um, but I think if that one, if there is a fee agreed, I think we will see a number of other big clubs match it and try and wiggle their way into uh hijacking that deal um, mm. now something I wanted to bring up which I don't know if you see Chelsea obviously have played Manchester City twice um, quite recently once in the league once in the FA Cup in the league I thought they played fairly well brought on some youngsters and almost got back into the game they then got absolutely trumped 4-0 in the Cup um, a couple of days later but the interesting thing that I want to bring up to you is, did you see their penalty with Julian Alvarez, who's just returned from being a World Cup winner? No. So he's got the ball, putting it down on the spot, and as the goalkeepers do, they try and play a little bit of mind games. So the goalkeeper's come down, he's bent down, he's moved the ball, he's, la- he's making some comments. Julian Alvarez bent down and laughed in his face before absolutely rifling a ball past him. And I thought that's the that's the most confident striker I've ever seen. He's happy with his life at the minute. He's he's just won the World Cup. <laughs> uh, he's playing second second fiddle to arguably one of the greatest to ever grace a football pitch if he carries on. And uh, yeah, just laughing in keepers' faces. It just it just really tickled me. Um, but yeah, that that was good. Um, Graham Potter coming under a little bit of fire. What do you make of it as an Arsenal fan? It's probably good good fun for you to watch them languishing hey, it's, down in It's tenth, cracking but... fun. <clears throat> yeah, I, um, I, I, I do find it quite amusing. Obviously, we've already mentioned the Aubameyang situation um, and obviously now this uh, Joe Felix one where there looks to be paying over the odds for him. But um, <clears throat> for me personally, I, I do feel a little bit so, sorry for Graham Potter because obviously he's taken... The, the opportunity that's been put in front with him. Um, but in terms of his managerial career, he's still got a long way ahead of yes. him. I think it's one job too soon, if I'm being completely honest. Um, I think he should have stuck out with 
Brighton to the end of the season. Yep. Um, he knew how to work with the players that he had at that particular point. But again, I can kind of see it from the other side that if someone like Chelsea does come calling, you can't really say no. We but don't, yeah. with the job that you do, do you potentially damage your reputation for for future clubs? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting. We had the discussion when, when they bought him. I think they wanted him to be part of a project in trying to pull every, all the strings together. Um, and mm-hmm. one of the, um, the interviews that Thomas Tuchel gave towards the end of last year, or it might be in the very beginning of this season, is, well, we're struggling still because we've got the same players. Uh, so we've still got the same problems. Now, Graham Potter's come in. He's been, well, I say he's been backed in a, in a transfer market. The owner has spent a lot of money in a transfer market. Doesn't necessarily mean that they are Graham Potter signings. Um, and you can see that there is a there is a tact there for how he wants to play. And there are moments of brilliance. What I would say with it is they are missing a lot of players. Reese James out injured, Kante out injured. Uh, I was going to say they haven't got a striker. They have, but they sent him on loan to Inter Milan. Um, but their other one, uh, Brozier, he's he's out injured. Um, so, so I mean, there are a lot of players that would make a difference to any any Premier League squad. I, I believe personally, um, but. <laughs> I think he needs to ditch the big names. A bit like Mikhail Arteta did in a certain extent. I don't care who you are. If you're not putting in the effort, I'm not playing you. Um, because when those players did come on, uh, Hutchinson, who used to be an Arsenal player, funnily enough, uh, Conor Gallagher ca- come on, although he's a little bit <laughs> temperamental, I would say. He's one of those who's got a bit of a temper on him. Uh, and Chad Kormeka, who they signed from Aston Villa, um, I thought they they looked pretty mustard, to be fair. And it was that sort of fast-paced attacking football which he wants to play. Mm. I, If I'm honest, I think you've got to give him... You've got to give him at least two, two years solid. Um, obviously, we see Arsenal struggle last season. Season before, there were moments where it was like, this is, this is, this is hard to watch. But... You trust in the process. If you trust in the man you've put in charge, it reaps rewards eventually. Um, but yeah, I, I do think you may be right. It may have been one step too soon. Um, but they picked him for a reason. They wanted mm. a, a oh, they wanted a British manager. They like what he's done at Brighton, and he has done worked wonders with Brighton. And they're still reaping the rewards. I think of his work behind the scenes um, as a whole. But I think Chelsea are Chelsea fans are so used to being able to chop and change manager, they're not the most patient fan base. That's what I was just about to say. I mean, we've been through, what, four, four years of struggling times. Mm. Um, there was the, I think it was the sixth place with Emery, fifth place with... Emery or whatever it was, you know what I mean? An eighth and an eighth. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, an eighth and an eighth uh, with no European football. So <clears throat> I think if Chelsea fans are prepared to go through the the hit and miss, then you're right. They they could be, um, it, it could be very optimistic as to what you can develop over the course of, if you're given time. Yeah. Um, but obviously... New owners, they they seem a little bit rash um, as it stands at the moment with some of the signings that they've made. Um, could it be, or could it get to a point? How far are they willing to go? Yeah, is is what I'm trying to get at. Before they go, do you know what? It's time to splash the cash again. You're not what we're after. Um, we can't see the project going anywhere. Off you go. Yeah. Um, in which case, he takes a nice little payout, and Bob's your uncle. Uh, on to the next one if if he can get another job but yeah i'm um i'm not not convinced i, I that think he's um, he's going to be given time i think it's a shame unfortunately that that amazon are not there doing a uh all or nothing because i think it would have been a quite interesting season at chelsea to see yeah um but that's not happened but what i would say is a lot of chelsea fans at the minute 
are new fans. Um, and what I mean by that is they're, they're, they're only fans since Roman Abramovich took over in, what, 2003, 2004, sort of? When you mm. speak to the older generation of Chelsea fans and they say, oh, yeah, but we languished down in the, in the lower lower dregs of, of football for a long time. We didn't play good football. It, they've been there, done it. So it may be bringing back some memories, but I think that the newer fan base who have only known them for the last 20-odd years which is a, a fair time, I give them that, are not coping with not being the big dog. But the last time they finished down the league in ninth or 10th, they did also win the Champions League. They're still in that competition. Every cloud. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying history will repeat itself, but it's not unheard of. Um, mm. So, with that being said, we make some predictions every week. Uh, and last week we predicted two or four games in total because we had the FA Cup, which, if I'm honest, produced some absolutely wonderful results. Half the Premier League teams got knocked out, which is brilliant. Uh, Wrexham are still through. I wanted to draw them so they could knock us out. Um, <laughs> not not for the fact I want to lose in the FA Cup. I love the FA Cup. But actually, what a brilliant story that would be. Um, and I'm sure there would be some reference to it in the next Deadpool movie. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Um yeah, so how how did we get on with our predictions from last week, Mike? Okay, so we had, um, as you said, two Premier League games. We had Arsenal versus Newcastle and Leeds versus West Ham. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> you went for a 2-2 draw. I went for a 2-1 win. Um, a very disappointing 0-0 draw for that one. Um, I've got to say, I'm very frustrated with... Um, that game, the time wasting, I think, started by Newcastle in the 15th minute. Um, and you could see that they'd literally come to park the bus. Yep. Um, and fair play to them. Fair play to them. Eddie Howe has got them well drilled. And they were frustrating, extremely frustrating to play against. Um, they got some big fuckers in defence as oh, well. Yeah. Excuse Dan my Burn. language. Dan Burns are lovely. <laughs> He's massive, absolutely massive. And you're pairing him up with Eddie and Ketia. There's only one winner in that battle. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Yeah, you um, don't even have to yeah, jump. So, <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there was a couple of controversial decisions in that game. Um, and the PGMOL or whatever the fuck they're called have come out with some absolute ridiculous bullshit once again to kind of justify the decisions that have been made. Yeah. Um, so uh, the less I speak about this game, the better. But it's nil nil, so it's a point to you and zero points to me. Uh, moving on to Leeds versus West Ham, um, you had a two nil to Leeds. I had a one one. Um, do you just want to give us a quick overview yeah, of this one? Uh, what I would say is that uh, the first goal we went one nil down quite early on. Fabianski rooted to the spot as he, as per usual, um, and yeah, went from there. We did work our way back in. Uh, but it, it didn't quite happen. Uh, but it was a more positive performance, more positive result. What I have started to notice is Skamaka, I think, is a bit fed up with waiting for people to feed him the ball. He doesn't see many touches. Uh, but what he has started doing is as soon as he gets the ball, he'll turn and shoot. Uh, and he's had a couple of really good efforts that have been saved. But, but this one uh, fooled everyone, went past the keeper, off the post, into the back of the net. Um, so yeah, he's getting a bit frustrated, but to all, it was a positive result uh, considering what we're doing, but not not the three points that we needed. So as, um, as I said, you had a two 0 uh, to Leeds on that one. I had one on one, so it's um, a point for me on that one. Yep. Uh, next game going into the FA Cup was uh, Brentford versus West Ham. You had a uh, 2-1 to West Ham on that one, and I had 3-1 to Brentford. Yeah, so we played uh, Ariola in that game, who I think is the better of our goalkeepers, made a few good saves, a few really close calls. It, it was quite a physical game. Um, but eventually, David Moyes uh, did bring on Saeed Benrahma. West Ham fans were chanting for him. They love him. He proceeded to get the ball, run at the fence and take a walloping shot from a fair way out past the keeper, uh, which was all good for the 1-0. However, it's quite clear David Moyes doesn't like him. Uh, in his post match Prince conference, he did come out and call him out saying, well, I thought he was a bit greedy, he probably should have passed that chance. Um, 
there was no one to pass to. Uh, but uh, this is what I mean. I, I think he's he, he's lost some of the players' respect. Uh, but when the fans love a player, he's a, he is our best player at the minute. Maybe not tech, uh, or, or not on paper, but he is the only player who's really pulling out performances. Has saved us a fair few times. He's scored most of our goals at the minute. Don't throw him under the bus when he's when he's actually won you the game. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it's a, 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 a very uh, it, it sort of feels like at the minute from a, a fan point of view that West Ham is very much a a tightrope at the minute, and it's a very windy day. Um, but yeah, so so again, but a positive result. I think it's bought Moyes some time until this weekend, and then we'll where the performance was a bit more positive again. So it's it's a bit of bittersweet in, in that sense of I wanted him wanted us to lose these two games so we could finally say thank you but goodbye and move on mm. to potentially bigger and better things. Okay, so once again you had uh, two one to uh West Ham and I three one to Brentford. So it's one nil as you mentioned. So one point to you and zero points to me. Uh finally we had Oxford United versus Arsenal. Um <clears throat> a game which I knew there was going to be a lot of rotation for. Um, and sure enough, there was. Um, you had 4-2 to Arsenal on this one. I had 3-1. Um, I've got to say, the first half was absolutely diabolical. Um, but I think it was diabolical from our side because Oxford did an amazing job. Yeah. Pressing, hungry, didn't give us a chance on the ball. Um, and if I'm being completely honest, I said to myself at half time. They're not going to be able to keep up with us, even our second slash fringe team, um, for the whole 90 minutes. And sure enough, um, they leaked um, very early on in the second half. You had <clears throat> uh, Eddie and Ketty with a brace and Mohamed El Neni uh, back post. Amazing free kick yeah, from Vieira. Yeah. Um, Boshed it into the, uh, into the back of the net and then two very good finishes from Eddie and Ketty. Um, so we won three three nil on that one. Uh, so it's a point each for the correct um, correct result. Um, so the total points for this week, Ian, you've on three and I'm on two, yes. uh, which turns to the season totals. Ooh, Ian, you're trouble. currently on thirty three and I'm on thirty five. Oh, still all to play for. Still very very close. By all means, let us know what your predictions are in the comment section or over on Twitter. Uh, we do like to hear what's going on, what your thoughts are on the upcoming games. Um, this week, only two. Wolves versus West Ham and Tottenham versus Arsenal. So, I mean... Your game is on the Saturday, it is. so uh, I'll let you go first. So, uh, I was saying before the game, we could be in the relegation zone before... Um, I think, yeah, potentially before we go into this game because Southampton play Manchester City. So they would, if they win, it would have to be by eight goals or nine goals, then we would go into the relegation zone. Uh, so I think it's unlikely. But if they do manage to get a result and then they draw with Everton at the weekend and we lose this game, we finish the weekend bottom of the Premier League, which is quite a concerning sight. Um, we are playing Wolves, who are currently one point below us, but are in 19th place. Um, and what I would say about this game, Wolves seem to be first-half merchants, which is the opposite to what they have been in, in recent seasons. Sorry, excuse me. Um, but we, I say we, West Ham, seem to start quite slowly. Um, so I feel like there could be a... Uh, tumbling of goals early on for Wolves and then we try and work our way back into this game in the second half when they take a little bit of a back seat. I, I'm going to go for Wolves to win this after their after being cheated out of the F, or out of a result against Liverpool by VAR um, so I'm going to go Wolves Wolves to West Ham 1 OK um, I'm going to, uh, plain and simple, cut it short and sweet. I've gone for 2-2 on this one. Very good. Uh, so now coming on to the uh, North London derby on Sunday, 4.30. Um, 
Am I looking forward to this one? No, I'm not, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we, I know we are top of the league currently, obviously, depending on the next few results from Manchester City is going to be key. Yeah. Um, but we just need to keep beating the teams in front of us. Um, <clears throat> there is an air of optimism just with the way that we have been playing. We've been um, managing to grind out either a win um, or not lose the game, which yep. is obviously why we're in the position that we are at the moment. And I just feel, obviously, with Tottenham, they've been so hit and miss um, just recently. In, in fact, no, all season, they've been really hit and miss. Um, conceding first, the majority of the times, going one or two down, um, and granted, clawing their way back into the games, and, and sometimes not. Um, however, form goes out the window, as we both know. It's a, it's a London derby, uh, playing at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Yep. Um, I'm going to go for 3 2 to Arsenal on this one. This is an interesting one for me. Um, Arsenal have got a tough run of fixtures coming up, as you said. Um, and I feel like Tottenham will take it uh, on the basis of. Because of that tough run of fixtures, I think there's going to have to be some squad rotation. I know you rested a majority of your first team. Um, uh, but then you've got to look at, OK, you've got Manchester United during the week and then or, or next weekend, and then you've got uh, Man City the weekend after that. So I think that, that getting that team make-up to be the strongest it can be for all three games is going to be quite difficult. Tottenham will step up their, their level for this game. Um I think it could be quite low scoring, though. I'm going to go 1 0 to Tottenham. It's a horrible thing to say that, but I just I feel like that, that they could pull out a result here and then just sit back see, and I, stifle you. I, I can't see them not conceding. I, I, I can't remember the last time. Yeah, that's true. Hugo Reese is awful. In, in the Premier League where they haven't conceded. I um, hmm. two one then two one Tottenham. Change my answer. Okay. You've made you brought a very good point there. Hugo Lloris is absolute dog shit. Um, he, couldn't <laughs> ca- he couldn't catch a cold in the in the World Cup. He can't catch a cold in the Premier League. So yeah, no, you're right. You are right. Um, two one. Okay. <laughs> Amended. So unless unless they win one nil. Unless they win, if, if, yeah, unless they win one nil, they'll go. You talk me out of it, you bastard. Um, so uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers, uh, I think they've got to replay uh, Liverpool in the FA mm-hmm. Cup because they were cheated out of a late winner. Um, so VAR ruled it out on the basis of we can't tell, um, which to me sounds like it's not clear and obvious as is in their mission statement. I know we go on about this a lot, but it's just wound up. The Tottenham star, Tottenham, the Wolverhampton Wanderers staff, then produced a video which shows quite clearly it was onside. So if I'm totally honest, I would be quite happy if the FA turned around and say, that was a referee and error, it should have been 3-2, we're going to give the result to Wolves because you, they've been cheated out of a result because of uh, match fixing, uh, essentially. Um, Liverpool get the rub of the green on a lot of VAR decisions they have done recently, even though they're awful at the minute. And I think if they hadn't got the rub of the green on a lot of these VAR decisions, they would be a lot further down the table than they are. Um, but what is your take on it? Do you think it wa- it was correct to be ruled off? Or do you think because it was so, we can't tell, we don't have the right camera angles, they should have just let it happen and rewarded them with the goal that they scored I think I've, uh, to be honest I think they should have been rewarded a uh, little rewarded them but it's one of these stupid stupid rules I think because the linesman had flagged it um that's why they said it wasn't overturned or or something stupid yep. or um again it's it's absolute bullshit I'm so sick of VAR um 
it's it's ruining the game. I know, I know there was controversial decisions and stuff before we have VAR, the, but but the idea was that it was supposed to be reduce. It's supposed to be eradicating. As far as I'm aware, it's supposed to be eradicating all these um, these incorrect decisions. But I can guarantee that since his introduction, there's been more controversial yeah. decisions than there were prior to um, to it being yeah. introduced. I know I I know that teams have teams that we support have benefited benefited from some of these dis- decisions because of AAR. Yeah. Um. But I've got to say I think that the the negatives far outweigh the positives that we've seen from these decisions. Yeah. I I I think I, it's an absolute joke. I personally think because of this video referee that you're not allowed to see, you're not allowed to hear, you're not allowed to find out why and how he's made that decision. I think it opens up match fixing to a much higher level. Much easier to do when you've got someone removed from it. You don't really know who it is. Sit in a room. Is he looking at it? Is he not? Is he just going, no, it's wrong. You saw you can't have that. He's taken the power away from the referee. uh, Who's now like, well, I've got nothing. I can't, might as well not have a referee. Just have a video ref. And go just play ninety minutes of football, and we'll figure it out. We will figure out what what goals are allowed and what ones aren't after the fact. Um, but yeah, I think you are right that there are much more. There there are more controversies, but worse controversies since VAR has been introduced than there were before. All right, you, every three yep. or four games or three or four rounds, you might go. There was a horrific decision there that ref missed, or an off the ball incident, but. Now it's it's every week. There's three games that have got at least one incident in there that's quite clearly wrong. Um, but well, it's like the um, the Newcastle game where um, there was two decisions that kind of went against us. Mm-hmm. First one was the grappling of uh, Gabriel in the penalty box. Had that been anywhere else on the pitch or even in our penalty box, you can guarantee penalty would have been given or if it was anywhere else on the pitch, free kick would have been given, yep. yellow card. Um, and it, it was the absolute ludicrousy that, again, what, listening to this ref watch, it infuriates me the way that they have, that they get time to to come out with these bullshit excuses as to defend the actions of the the referee they like um the um the the managers and man of the match players or whatever they should have to come out and do an interview straight after the game to justify why they've made those decisions yeah but they have to do a report don't they They have to do a match report yeah, so and, why can't they and then, this is another thing that's come out of it: us, us getting charged because we were a pit or we crowded round the referee appealing a penalty. That's fucking bullshit. There was about two occasions when Newcastle players were surrounding the um, the referee as well for for decisions that have been made. But again, I'm starting to get angry about it. Anyway, um, <laughs> VAR is bullshit. But the second one, the second one, um, the the penalty um, for for handball last minute. Um, I will actually defend this one, and I think as I would be infuriated if it was given against us, yeah. um, because I think whilst yes, it did make contact with his hand, it was a very close proximity, and you can kind of justify it. So I kind of get that one, but the the certainly the the first one for the rugby tackle on Gabriel, I think is absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, so ran over. Here's, here's the thing. Uh, I get, I'm going to use the Arsenal game as uh, Arsenal versus Oxford as the example because the the commentators made such a thing about it. Of if VAR was in this game, maybe that wouldn't be given. If VAR was in this game, maybe Oxford would have got this decision or that decision, or maybe Arsenal would have got this decision. Uh, with a competition, whereas not everyone is subject to VAR, do you think they should? it should be scrapped completely for that competition because what what, what was given in one game isn't even looked at in another, which gives someone an unfair advantage somewhere. Absolutely, 100%. Um, it, it's got to be um, it's got to be matched equally and fairly. And you're right, it gives the um, certainly the lower division clubs an unfair advantage, sorry, unfair disadvantage yes. because they haven't got the technology in place. Um, obviously, for for Premier League clubs, they do have the technology in place. Therefore, I can understand why they used it, but it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it right for for every other one of those 
clubs that can't provide or haven't got that technology, you need to bring it off for the whole competition. Yeah. Hundred percent. I, I think I, I think you're right. I, I do agree with that. I think it should be it should be binned off. Now there is there is the case to be made once it goes to the semi finals, it's played in a neutral venue, potentially at that point to go. We need to make sure that the the, the correct res- result is is got here by obvious mistakes being ruled out. However, uh, as uh, as I'm sure you, you know what I'm going to say, there probably be more mistakes with it than there would be without. So it's. It's, it's a difficult one, but I, I certainly think that there are a number of clubs who would have benefited from VAR at some point in the competition. Because because we only see, as Premier League club fans, we only really watch it from the third round. This the FA Cup is a competition that starts well before the start of the season. It, it's pre-season mm-hmm. stuff for some people to to get into the first round. There's like a six rounds of qualifying before you get the first yeah. round, then the second, round. then the third round. Premier League clubs come in it, so I think they're. They're, they're quite lucky in some senses. They don't have to qualify for all of it like some of the, the, the non-league clubs do. Um, but, say, none of them, I'm sure there's some that went out early early doors that would have benefited from a VAR decision. But it didn't happen. So, yeah, mm. get rid of it completely. Uh, if it's not applicable to every team in the competition at the same time. Um, yep. So, have you got anything else to add to this week's podcast, mate? Um, nothing football related, but congratulations to uh, to Michael Smith for for winning the PDC World Darts tournament. Um, first, oh, in fact, no, second major this year. Um, again, completely not football related, but I uh, I do love a bit of the darts. So congratulations to him. I did want Michael Van Gogh to win, um, but happy for Michael Smith to win. The, the only That's bit, the only me. bit I've got bit, the only bit I really paid attention to was the geezer geez with the ear defenders. Um, <laughs> like, did, did you see my tweet on that yes yes I did and that, that's what drew me to it and I, I looked into it a bit more and you know what everyone loves a pantomime villain don't they it's abs- yeah, absolute absolutely. great banter um, but yeah so so this week has all been all about the transfer roundabout that is the January transfer window so until next week I've been Ian I've been Mike make sure you're subscribed and we'll see you very very soon